Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. Now, when it comes to the debate about the moon landings, probably the most common question against it is, why has nobody gone back? It's been more than 50 years since humans last stepped foot on the moon, so surely the fact that nobody's been back since, even with newer technology, is evidence that it's not that easy and so they never went in the first place, right? Well, no. I did a video trying to address this some 18 months ago. However, it is still something that I get asked about on pretty much a daily basis, and a lot of the comments on that previous video seem to not fully grasp the argument that I was putting forward, because they seem to think that I was saying that America just doesn't have the money to pay to send people back to the moon now, which is not the case. It's not a question of having the money, it's a question of justifying the amount of money that it costs and what benefit it would present. It's politics. I mean, in fact, it's the basic budgeting concept that we ourselves do personally pretty much every day of the week. We all have a finite amount of money available and we have to weigh up the options of how that money is used and how you can be in a situation where you could look at one thing for an amount of money and think, nah, I'm not really sure that's worth buying, and yet something else for the exact same amount of money, you could justify spending it. I mean, any one of us now, for example, could go and open our wallet, take out some money, and just throw it in the bin. There would be nothing physically stopping you from doing that, but I imagine the vast majority of people in that scenario would think, no, I'm not going to do that, because it wouldn't give me enough benefit to justify what it would cost to do it. And yet, you could take that exact same amount of money and spend it with Brilliant.org and get a heap of benefits from it. I mean, for me, they are one of the best online learning platforms around. They have hundreds of classes across math, science, and computing. All of the courses start off simple and then build up, and you can jump ahead to the harder classes if you wish, so there really is something for everyone. I find the classes to be very engaging as well through their use of interactive animations, and that for me makes it much easier to understand the topics. In fact, I find it so engaging that my daily streak of using Brilliant is now up to 550 consecutive days. That's 18 months. Why not see if you'd enjoy Brilliant as much as I am by taking a 30-day free trial, visiting my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and doing so will also entitle you to 20% off their annual subscription. 30 days of using Brilliant, zero cost. Like I was saying, there's an easy justification with that decision of whether it's worth it or not. But just because you have the money available for something doesn't mean it's necessarily worth spending it. Like, quite a few people bring up a point along the lines of, oh, they'll give billions to Ukraine, but they won't spend billions to go back to the moon. Which ultimately highlights that politics is the root problem with going back to the moon. The money needed for NASA to go to the moon needs to come from the US government. The US government has more than enough money available to send people back to the moon. Hell, it probably has more than enough money to have sent people to Mars by now. But there are many other US departments all fighting for funding as well, and the government are going to make decisions based on what they feel will make them more popular with voters. I mentioned that point in my previous video when a few people sniffed at the idea, but that is politics. Every election campaign, at least here in the UK, consists of the various parties talking about what things they would spend more money on and where they would reduce spending and how the other parties in charge have been poor with their spending, all with the goal of impressing the public to vote for them. I mean, I don't keep up with US politics these days, but I recall a few years ago Trump's election campaign vowing to spend billions to erect the wall along the US-Mexico border, and a lot of people saw a benefit with that. But he would never have suggested spending the same amount of money building a wall around Montana because nobody would have voted for it. Sure, the US could increase NASA's funding back to the levels that they saw at Apollo, and they could have colonized the moon or go to Mars. But where would the money come from? And would it be worth it? Either funding would have to be cut from other areas, 
or the total amount available to the government would need to increase, but that would mean increasing taxes. And ultimately, like I said, the bigger question is, would that be worth the cost? I mean, saying the US could afford it, so why haven't they, is like saying Apple's worth three and a half trillion dollars. They've already acquired some 130 different companies, so they could easily afford to buy the second-hand clothes shop down the road from me, so why haven't they? Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that the US doesn't have an incentive to go to the moon. The question is cost versus benefit. I mean, take Apple again. They've recently launched Apple TV. They could, in theory, buy out every other big streaming service, but they haven't, presumably because what it would cost them, they wouldn't see enough of a return to justify spending it. Yet, hypothetically, if they were offered all of those other companies for a dollar each, I'm sure they would do it. The driving force behind the US spending so much back in the 60s was their desire to outdo the Soviets. If the Soviets hadn't been pushing for space, the US probably wouldn't have bothered with the moon. They would have just been content with low Earth orbit. In fact, they weren't. Kennedy was not bothered about going to the moon until the Soviets beat them into space. Then priorities changed. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957. Now it is time to take longer strides Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. Competition is what drives things forward. And this was during the tensions of the Cold War. And being able to get to the moon was then the ultimate flex of who had the best technology and who could build the biggest rockets. You know, if tech companies didn't have other tech companies trying to outdo them, there'd be no rush to innovate. So once the US had gotten to the moon and the Soviets had given up, there was much less incentive for the government to then keep funding it. Now, a few people did put forward quite a valid question that if it was just about getting to the moon, why didn't they just stop after Apollo 11? Why carry on with the other missions? And for this, there's a few factors. The first is that most of the mission costs were paid well in advance. Each Saturn V took somewhere around two years to build, and preparations for each mission started well in advance. So by the time Apollo 11 had landed on the moon in July 1969, the construction and foundations of the next several missions were already well underway. But there is also politics of how cutbacks can make you appear. In January 1970, NASA cancelled the proposed Apollo 20 mission so that they could use that Saturn V to launch the Skylab. Then following another budget cutback in mid-1970, they scrapped the proposed Apollos 18 and 19, but Nixon was considering making them scrap 16 and 17 as well. After the success of Apollo 15 in July 1971 as the first J mission with the extended lunar module that was capable of a three-day landing and using the rover, Nixon wanted 16 and 17 to be scrapped to further reduce spending. But in August 1971, he received a memo from Caspar Weinberger, who was the deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget, who called such a scrapping a mistake suggesting that cancelling those missions immediately after the success of Apollo 15 could give the appearance that the US were basically backtracking and that budget cuts could be made elsewhere. So a more gradual reduction was agreed instead. But let's get back to why they haven't gone back since. Because as a few people have pointed out, successive presidents have vowed to go back to the moon, but so far none have. And this again is where the justification problem comes in. For Apollo, NASA were essentially given a blank check and told, make it happen, whatever it costs, because they needed to outdo the Soviets. They needed to get to the moon first. Those incentives no longer exist. People think it's odd that they haven't been back to the moon in 55 years, yet in the early 1900s, lots of expeditions were being funded to try and trek to the South Pole. Once that was finally achieved in 1911, people stopped going. It wouldn't then be until 1958, 47 years later, before someone trekked from the coast to the pole again. 
because once something's been done once, there is much less incentive to keep doing it. And if you're going to do it again, there's no point just repeating what you've already done previously. You want to push the boundaries further, which is what happened with the South Pole. The 1911 expeditions were treks from their landing site to the pole and then back to the landing sites. The 1958 expedition set out to cross the whole of Antarctica through the South Pole. And that's the same problem with the moon. Apollo missions could get two people onto the surface of the moon and their time spent outside was no more than 24 hours. And they never traveled further than walking distance from their landing site and they had limited capabilities as to what experiments they could perform on the surface. Just doing a repeat of that nowadays isn't worth the effort and costs involved, especially when pretty much all of it could be repeated by unmanned rovers. If you're going to go back, you need to go big. But there isn't the incentive to spend the huge portions of the country's budget on doing it. It would be different if they found like rare minerals on the moon that they could then go and mine, you know, they'd be jumping over each other to go back then because that would give them a big benefit to justify the initial upfront costs. Most of us have probably seen the movie Avatar. In case you haven't, why not? Essentially, they discover a distant planet with a vast supply of mineral called unobtainium and they set up a base there to mine it. Because this little gray rock sells for 20 million a kilo. That's the only reason. It's what pays for the whole party. It's what pays for your science. Now, the company in that hypothetical scenario would have spent an absolute fortune up front to get all the personnel and equipment across space to that planet to do that. But long term, it was very beneficial to do it. If they hadn't have found such a reason to go, they would not have spent that much money to do that. So from a political standpoint, there are reasons to go back to the moon, but none are big enough to justify the huge costs to the government. They, so they want it done cheap. Obviously, they always want things done cheap. Now, it wasn't until 2005 that the idea of going back to the moon came about, with the Bush administration greenlighting the Constellation program, which would develop the Orion capsule, the Altea lander, and the Ares 1 and 5 rockets to respectively launch them. These proposed essentially an enlarged Apollo concept with a lander five times the volume of the Apollo lunar module that would be able to support a crew for weeks and have the ability to land unmanned versions for resupply. This project, however, quickly started to run over budget and was struggling to meet deadlines. Within five years, when the Obama administration came to office, they deemed the Constellation program unfeasible and scrapped it all in favor of SLS which has subsequently ran over budget and is struggling to meet deadlines. Probably not helped by the fact that both of these projects are trying to derive heavy lift rockets from space shuttle hardware rather than developing a new rocket from scratch fit for the purpose, presumably in an attempt to keep costs down, but failing. But this sort of thing is pretty typical with government projects these days. Governments want projects done cheaply and they don't want to approve large budgets up front because it makes them look lavish. So contractors tell them that they can do it cheaply when in reality most of the time they can't. And with the way that everything is these days, having to be micromanaged by 101 departments and everything being wrapped up in red tape, most major projects seem to wind up going way over budget and taking too long. I mean, I've seen it quite a few times here in the UK. In 2002, the government set out a £6 billion project to upgrade the IT infrastructure with the NHS so that everything could be done online and all the hospitals could link together. Ten years and £12 billion later, the project got scrapped, having never actually been used. We've had it with railway, with motorway and telecoms projects all recently that have gone way over budget and taken much longer than was originally planned. So a NASA project doing the same thing is not really a surprise. And then with regards to what I said earlier about if you're going to go back, then go big, that's what they're planning. They aren't looking to just put a couple of people on the surface for a matter of hours. They want to land a Starship variant on the moon. They want the Lunar Gateway orbiting the moon, which is essentially like a mini space station. They basically want a long-term presence on the moon and they want to land near the poles, which makes the whole thing even more complicated. But 
the US government don't want to pay for it all because there isn't enough incentive there to justify the cost. That's why they've turned to the likes of SpaceX, because SpaceX can then utilize their own hardware privately, not just for NASA. I.e., a lot of their revenue comes from the likes of Starlink, which is ever-growing. They're now starting private flights with the Dragon capsules, not just NASA flights to the ISS. All of that can then give them extra revenue to help fund their push to the moon. But from the side of NASA and the US government, funding that entire project just by themselves would cost a lot. It would be doable, but they'd probably struggle to justify it with the voters. Allowing private companies to come on board then shifts a lot of the costs over to them, but they've had to wait for the private companies to want to come on board. Although, now that they have, they have the fun of red tape bureaucracy delaying everything. I mean, look at SpaceX, for example. They've been ready to launch their fifth full Starship test for weeks, but haven't been allowed because they're waiting for approval from the FAA, who themselves, I think, are waiting for approval from an environmental department who are assessing the environmental impact of the launch. And I believe one of the big holdups is assessing the launch suppression system because it's deemed as industrial waste, even though it seemingly uses drinking water. Either way, pushing to go back to the moon now takes a lot longer than back in the 60s because there's a lot more red tape to jump through that seemingly didn't happen with the Apollo era. And there's been a lot less incentive to go back, although that might be starting to change now with China aiming to send people to the moon and the politics flexing maybe happening again. But anyways, that's going to wrap it up for this video. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you've enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.